All right, uh, we'll go ahead and get started now. Uh, we have quite a few joined already and, and uh, many more seem to be joining as we go. Um, I wanna um, just introduce myself briefly. My name is Abe Gardner. I'm the EMG product manager for Cadwell Laboratories. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us today for our, our Education in Isolation webinar series. Uh, this is, um, we've had quite a few webinars already. Please check our website. We have another one coming up um, next week on repetitive nerve stimulation, um, and we will have many more in the near future. Uh, the topic today is quantifying normal and abnormal EMG, and it will be presented by Professor Emeritus Eric Stahlberg of Uppsala, Sweden. Uh, just a brief introduction of Eric before I give the time to him. In uh, 1966, Professor Stahlberg wrote his PhD thesis on propagation propagation velocity in individual human muscle fibers and developed single fiber EMG together with Dr. Jan Ekstedt. Over the last 30 years, Eric has developed methods of, for quantification of conventional EMG, and in addition, introduced EMG methods such as ma macro EMG and scanning EMG. He studied the microphysiology in normal and diseased muscle and also worked on telemedicine and neurophysiology for routine applications. This webinar will consist of both a lecture and a clinical demonstration. We'll have a brief question and answer session after the lecture, and then a second and final question and answer session after the clinical demonstration. You can submit questions in the toolbar on the right side of your screen at any time during the lecture and or clinical demonstration. We have a very large audience today, uh, so we will do our best to get through as many questions as we can in the time provided. And if we aren't able to get through them all, we will follow up with some text responses um, to all those who, who have attended and registered uh, with some of the, any of the questions that we're not able to answer uh, during the time provided. I want to thank Eric for helping us with this webinar and now turn the time over to him. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, happy to be here and, and I hope you, you feel well. It is a fantastic start of the week to start with quantitative EMG, isn't it? Uh, I'm going as Abe, uh, told you uh, to have a lecture uh, about 30 minutes uh, about the things that we know or we think we know about the generation of the EMG signal, the motor unit signal. Uh, and um, then we have uh, a video presentation of a practical, practical recording. Uh, I hope you can enjoy that and please uh, come with your questions and uh, uh, those that we cannot respond to now, we can do that uh, at the later uh, occasion. So I think uh, we, uh, we start with the presentation right now. This video will discuss the basic aspects of quantitative EMG. It will cover the generation of motor unit potentials, the different parameters, and the interpretation of the parameters. The motor units in a normal muscle occupy a space of about 5 to 15 millimeters in diameter and the territory of individual motor units overlap. The muscle fibers within a motor unit territory are distributed uh, randomly. Here is an example of two motor units, one blue and one yellow, and the yellow one has its uh, 50 to 200 muscle fibers connected and randomly distributed and the blue motor unit is overlapping with that. In pathology we have just a few types of reactions. In myopathy we have smallness of muscle fibers and also hypertrophic muscle fibers with splitting of muscle fibers. We have reduced number of fibers and an increased interstitial uh, tissue. This gives a weaker electrical signal uh, to the EMG electrode. In situations of denervation, renovation, 
we have the following here is a yellow motor unit that is denervated and the muscle fibers start to fibrillate and they attract re innovation from surviving motor units by means of collateral sprouting from surviving motor units in this case the blue motor unit therefore incorporates yellow muscle fibers and it becomes larger and therefore also a stronger electrical generator when we do the EMG we have three steps one to look at spontaneous activity one to look at the shape of motor unit potentials and the third step is to look at the recruitment of motor units and their activity at full uh, force the spontaneous activity I just mentioned briefly because we do not have methods for automatic quantitation here we have normal spontaneous activity as insertional activity end plate noise nerve spikes and positive waves at the end plate zone and we have abnormal spontaneous activity either generated in the muscle fibrillation potentials myotonic discharges complex repetitive discharges and from the axon neuromyotonic discharges myochymic discharges fasciculations neurogenic extra discharges and here we have some examples uh, well known to all of you fibrillation potentials or single fiber potentials that are repeating with a constant usually with a constant frequency positive waves is also seen in denervated muscle fibers myotonic discharges are, are increasing in frequency and uh, amplitude waxing and waning both amplitude and frequency complex repetitive discharges are starting abruptly and consists of a number of muscle fibers that are completely time locked without any jitter between them these are from individual muscle fibers and then we have the signals generated in the axon indicated by the fact that they uh, are uh, motor unit potentials not single fiber potentials one is the neuromyotonic discharges or myochymic discharges which is a number of motor units that fire together in bursts of activity and fasciculation potentials that occur randomly with irregular air frequency now it comes to voluntary EMG the discussion that we have here is true both for concentric needle electrode and for monopolar electrode here are the end plates and the electrical activity travels in both directions from the end plate and here we have the single fiber potentials that are generated from each muscle fiber with higher amplitude from those fibers that are close to the recording tip and when they arrive at the electrode they have a certain scatter mostly dependent on different speed along the muscle fibers which is directly related to the muscle fiber diameter and when they are summated they uh, produce any uh, shape depending on on the dispersion this is an EMG simulator based on data from literature this is the cross section of the muscle longitudinal section of the muscle with motor end plates here in the center and here is a small blow up area of a certain uh, section we insert the muscle fibers here and uh, we also insert the concentric needle electrode that I can move in the same way as we do with um, in our routine and this particular position gave rise to this this motor unit potential and if we move the electrode to another place in in the muscle we get other shapes of the motor unit potential so you you see how in the same motor unit we get any shape of the motor unit potential but when we run 
the consecutive discharges here, you see that for a standard position, the motor unit potential has a constant shape. And now we are going to look at myopathy. So I have introduced fibers randomly and the, the electrode here, and we obtain this signal with, uh, in the normal situation. Is polyphasicity in myopathy due to loss of muscle fibers? Let's look at that. Here I delete one fiber after the other, and you can see the result down to the left here. Here we uh, remove one fiber, we remove another fiber, we remove more fibers, and you see that the signal really doesn't become polyphasic, but rather uh, more simple and uh, lower in amplitude and shorter. Let's restore the motor unit with uh, a number of muscle fibers uh, in the area. And now we we make the other typical change that we see in muscle biopsy, namely fiber diameter variation and smallness of fibers. So we reduce the size a little, and particularly we change the fiber diameter variation. So now I arrange that, and you see all of a sudden we got this very polyphasic motor unit. So polyphasicity in the early myopathy at least, is due to increased fiber diameter variation. Put in the muscle fibers again, the electrode again here, and we record these fibers. And now we have um, the situation of re that, that means that this blue motor unit is re other surrounding motor units that we don't see on the screen here, and the signal is increasing in amplitude as indicated here, and become longer duration and higher amplitude. One typical thing is that we have fiber diameter variation because some muscle fibers have become atrophic while waiting for re -innovation. So I introduce smallness of muscle fibers and particularly fiber diameter variation. And here you see the polyphasicity that occurs. And another typical thing is that that um, there is an uncertain neuromuscular transmission. So we increase that to from 20 to 60. And then when we run the signal, you can see how the uh, shape varies. And it's also a bubbling sound. That is the early ongoing re -innervation. So, therefore, the different parameters tell us different stories. And here are the parameters that we can assess visually or manually, namely amplitude, duration, number of phases, turns, and satellites, and instability. And these parameters tell us about number of fibers close to the tip, total number of fibers within larger area, and temporal dispersion of the signals. And here, therefore, we measure the, the duration from start to end, according to some special definition, number of phases above and below the baseline, or perhaps even more accurate to measure number of turning points because not all turns dip across the zero line, so it does not produce phases, but the number of turns are many. So we talk about polyphasic and polyturns or serrated or complex. But the other thing is that we can analyze these parameters with computer. And we, then we measure amplitude and area and duration and something we call thickness, which is the area divided by amplitude and number of phases, rise time, satellites, and so on. And that is uh, done in the following way. The similar uh, principle for different equipment. Here is 
epoch of, of signals, five seconds or 10 seconds. And the computer is finding those signals that are identical in shape. This one, this, 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 and this one. And they are placed in uh, one memory box. And then we have another shape, this, 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 and they are placed in another memory box. And all the signals in a given memory box are averaged, and we obtain this result. Here we got 33 of this signal type with the, with the average, and the other disturbing have disappeared, and 29 of this, and 21 of this, and so forth. And here is the final result, and we usually uh, try to obtain at least 20 of the, the different motor unit signals with uh, recording from two skin insertions and maybe a total of 10 different recording positions. Here is a typical small uh, section of recordings from a normal very slight neurogenic situation with a slight increase in amplitude and smallness of the myopathic uh, motor unit potentials. The other thing that we look at is the instability of the motor unit shape. We trigger on the signal somewhere here and superimpose, for example, 10 discharges. This is seen here on the top trace uh, in from a normal muscle and this is from a patient with ALS where we have great variation in shape due to unstable uh, neuromuscular uh, transmission in the re motor unit. This we call jiggle. Now we have so many parameters to measure. Is it really not possible to define that one of them is best and should be used uh, routinely. We can look at that. Here are two situations. These are a, a group of patients with polymyositis and uh, here is a group of patients with ALS recording from tibial anterior muscle. And you see that the amplitude on this slide uh, varies from minus uh, three standard deviation to plus uh, two standard deviations. Whereas the ALS has this variation and some of these in, in myositis is definitely shorter than those in ALS and those in ALS are, are definitely higher than those in myositis. But the problem is that we have a large overlap in motor potentials of normal amplitude. The same thing with duration. In myositis we have some that are uniquely shorter and in, in ALS we have some that are uniquely longer but there is also an overlap between the findings. This is area of the signal, maybe a little better and here is something we call thickness area divided by amplitude and here is a normalized area that we call size index that they separate a little better. The conclusion is that there is no single parameter that is superior to um, the other in each case. Uh, but the combination of two or three parameters together can uh, give a typical profile for myopathy and neuropathy. For all these things, it's important to have reference uh, values from your own laboratory or from literature in case you use exactly the same technique and software as uh, described for the collection of, of reference material. We don't go into the statistics of that right now. Only a reminder that reference values is a must. Some comments on the analysis of the EMG pattern during increasing force, that's called recruitment analysis, and during strong contraction that we call the analysis of interference pattern. The different methods that we have available is 
recruitment analysis, visual inspection, spectral analysis, turns amplitude and modifications thereof. The recruitment pattern can be analyzed by some parameters called onset frequency, recruitment frequency and recruitment ratio according to the following. Here is the start of the firing usually with a low frequency of 6-7 Hz and we talk about onset frequency the frequency of the first motor unit when it is uh, recruited. When we increase the force a little other motor units are coming in and when number two is coming in we measure the frequency of number one and that is called the recruitment frequency. This is number one has nine hertz when motor unit number two is coming in. Then we activate a little more and when we optionally find that we have three or four or five motor units on the screen we do the following. We look at the firing rate of the fastest, in this case 14 Hz, and then we see how, how many different motor units are there on the screen, in this case 4, and then we take 14 divided by 4, and the recruitment ratio is 3.5. When we now activate more strongly, then we have so much activity that we can no longer look at individual motor unit potentials but uh, use other techniques to, to analyze the interference pattern. When we have dropout of motor units, we have the following situation. The first motor unit is coming in here, but there is no second one coming in, and we increase the uh, force even more, and then number three is coming in, now at a higher rate of number one than we had before, and that is called uh, the recruitment frequency is not 9 but in this case 12 and the recruitment ratio is uh, 5.3 and if we have a myopathy on the other hand uh, the, the other motor units are coming in earlier in the contraction so the first motor unit has uh, only a frequency of 7 Hz when the next one is coming in and the recruitment ratio is lower than normally. This is called early recruitment and here is an actual recording where we see first motor unit potential firing here and all of a sudden a new motor unit here is coming in and then we measure the frequency of the first motor unit between these two spikes and we can measure the uh, frequency when number two came into play. Now we can look at little stronger activity and that can be done visually when we have a possibility to eyeball the uh, total amplitude. Usually we cut away some of the highest and some of the lowest and assess an average envelope amplitude and we see the fullness of the EMG pattern and low amplitudes. Here in the normal we have an, another uh, amplitude and we still have a full interference line. And with neuropathy we have even higher amplitude and we have gaps in the signal uh, uh, due to dropout of motor units. This is one way where we look at it and we listen to it. Another way is to uh, measure uh, the frequency content in the signal. In normal situation we have some low frequency and high frequencies of the individual spikes and if we have a, a neurogenic condition we have less of the high frequency signal. They are uh, larger and more bumpy and if we have a myopathy we have um, many high frequency uh, signals and relatively speaking more of high frequency than low frequency signals. Another way to uh, look at the interference pattern was introduced by Willison in the beginning of 60s 
and with our modification according to the following. We measure number of turning points in the signal. For each peak we get the turn. So number of turning points per second. And the other parameter is the amplitude between turning points. Amplitude between one turn and the next turn. And then we can plot the number of turns per second here and the amplitude between turns here. In myopathy we have lower amplitude and here are 20 recordings in a given muscle at different sides which is the typical situation. And here is our reference uh, uh, limits. And in neuropathy we have low number of turns and many of the recording sites show abnormalities in the amplitude outside and above the normal limit. Here we have another uh, situation where we have a rather severe myopathy with uh, mainly polyphasic motor units and they are also a long duration when we include the entire uh, signal. And when we look at the uh, individual motor unit data, here is amplitude and here is duration, you see that uh, all the recordings except one is within the normal limits. So that was not very sensitive to detect pathology. But when we look at the, exactly the same muscle with the turns amplitude, then we see uh, all the small spikes uh, that uh, do not show up in the uh, MUP analysis. But here we see the low amplitude and the increase in number of, of turning points. So the two techniques complement each other. When it comes to central drive, when we have a stroke spinal cord lesion, it is more difficult to, de to detect EMG uh, abnormalities. We can use the pattern of, of the EMG signals during uh, moderate and strong contraction. The uh, rhythm and the, the frequency and the stability of the firing rate. We can look at the fullness of the EMG pattern, usually reduced fullness, and that can be quantitated with a root mean square, for example. Or we can do combination of recording the, the C map during electric stimulation and the root mean square of voluntary EMG. In the central disorder we have a normal C map but a reduced RMS. And there are also other techniques that can be used. Finally, when we have different conditions here with neuromuscular junction problem, myopathy, reinnervation, ex exonal loss, conduction block, and central disorder. Single fiber EMG show abnormalities in all these three and uh, particularly sensitive to detect problems in a neuromuscular junction. When we have conventional EMG, we uh, separate myopathy from neuropathy better than the single fiber EMG and when we use conventional interference pattern analysis we do not detect the changes in the neuromuscular junction but can detect in addition to the MUP analysis also axonal loss conduction block and maybe that I um, examined. Um, the whole um, investigation as I will tell in the next video, takes uh, um, about uh, three, four, five minutes. And uh, <clears throat> the editing afterwards, I spend uh, maybe 30 seconds. It's mainly a quick thing just to delete uh, unacceptable uh, signals. And then we get the numbers in tabular form and uh, in uh, in different charts. And the good thing is that 
uh, we, we get the numbers of the changes. If we, for example, have a, a patient one time that has moderate neurogenic changes, if we call it so, moderate neurogenic changes, and the next time, is it more moderate or less moderate? It's really very difficult, particularly if the patient is seen by another doctor the next time. And here it is really helpful to, um, to, to have the possibility to follow over time. And also, as I indicated in the video, that uh, we are able to be sure about uh, findings in the gray zone. Is, is this really myopathic or not? And then we get the fantastic support by the quantitation uh, that can help to, to make that uh, uh, decision. Um, Hello, can you can you hear me, Stefan? Yes, yes, Stefan. Okay, I don't I don't know where uh, Abe went, but I can see the questions. Uh, and one question is, uh, what does polyphasic mean exactly? Um, it means that the signal has uh, 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 faces below and above the baseline, and it is uh, more than. Uh, uh, four phases, so it is five phases or more that is called polyphasic. And um, mm -hmm. if, if we uh, instead do not use phases but number of turns, if it is more than five turns, that means six turns or more, then we call it serrated or complex signal. And the polyphasicity is due to uh, time dispersion of the arriving signals due to slow velocity in thin muscle fibers and fast velocity in big muscle fibers. So it's a fiber diameter variation that is measured in this way. Okay, I have another one. How to detect conduction block with EMG? Uh, no, it is um, uh, really not uh, easy at all. It is only that the interference pattern is reduced. You know, it is the same as when you have a, a patient with post polio or whatever. It's a neurogenic pattern with uh, not a full interference pattern at strong uh, contraction. Uh, uh, how uh, QEMG is help for, helpful for a neuromuscular junction? <clears throat> well, the, uh, uh, the, the jitter, the uncertainty in the individual uh, motor end place gives unstable motor unit potentials. They vary in shape from one discharge to the other and also the amplitude, because they summate in different ways, the amplitude of the MUP varies very much. And that was actually the very first sign of, of myasthenia in the old days, in even 1930s, uh, they uh, noticed that, that the amplitude of the MUP varied at consecutive discharges. So you, you can see this variability, but it is, uh, uh, then the situation that you go over to single fiber, which is the other business. Can you explain the utility of the thickness of motor units in different clinical settings? The uh, thickness that we did not discuss so much, it's the uh, area divided by amplitude and some statistics around that. It is very sensitive to neurogenic changes. It is a little less uh, sensitive to myopathic, but uh, we have written a few articles about uh, the motor unit, the size index. That is again to differentiate myopathy from neuropathy. Uh, if we see re innervation and giant motor unit potentials and signal oscillations in the compressive neuropathy, is it a good sign? The, um, and the uh, big, big signals, high amplitude, long duration, is certainly a sign of re-innervation. Uh, and 
in the beginning, the first three months, there is also a great variability in shape that we call the jiggle, instability. And the instability says that some, some things is ongoing. So that is a good sign. You can uh, expect to have even better clinical situation a little later. If the signals, however, are very stable when you see the patient after three, four months, then you say it's no more renovation going on here. So, and that can make the decision whether it or not to operate, for example. You can say, is nothing more to expect from, from Mother Nature? We must do something. Okay. Can you please elaborate how you grade the polyphasicity of a muscle and also how you grade the spontaneous activities? Uh, in many laboratories, you grade. Uh, these things with one plus, two plus, three plus, four plus, um, and the the um, the uh, very slight abnormalities are one plus, and the very profuse fibrillations, for example, is uh, four plus. In my laboratory, we have used another technique. We say, in how many out of ten recording sites? do we see fibrillation potentials? Little or much? Uh, two out of 10, seven out of 10. That is uh, when, uh, when we move the needle to different uh, uh, places, two skin insertions and five recording sites in each of them. Polyphasicity, we do not really uh, grade visually. We say it's mo moderate, a number of motor units that are polyphasic, or there are, are many motor units that are polyphasic. Uh, when we use software that I'm going to show in a video in a, in a while, uh, then we measure number of phases, but I don't think it is uh, so uh, useful to have that number. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we have uh, Abe on board again. Uh, is that right, Abe? If so, maybe we should uh, show the next video. Yes, thank you for covering that. We had some technical difficulties in, in the US for some reason. Um, thanks for helping out, Stefan. Yeah, I'll go ahead and start the clinical demonstration now, and then we'll we'll um, end that with a, with a final Q&A. Okay. In this short video, I'm going to show some aspects of quantitative EMG. Um, and just um, uh, uh, one heads up is we had uh, Eric use our new software that will be released later this year. So if you're using Cadwell now, you'll know some you'll notice some minor differences in the software. The workflow though is very this, very much the same as what you have now, um, but this this new update will be available later this year. Uh, we will start with the triggering of the motor unit potential and then discuss recruitment firing analysis, multi map analysis, and interference pattern analysis. Well, first we have to introduce the patient ID and also the age or birthday, uh, since that is uh, necessary to obtain or to localize the correct uh, reference values. Height and uh, is necessary. Weight is uh, at the moment not necessary. And here we choose the muscle and I'm going to investigate the extensor digitorum. We uh, insert the needle. I'm holding the needle like a pen and uh, with, with a slight uh, with a slight activation, uh, uh, I, I insert the needle. And uh, in order to, to look at fibrillation potentials, we have to, to make sure that we are inside the muscle. So I ask the patient to activate a little so that we know that we are inside the muscle. And here I am in the muscle, and we move to the, a few different places, like in the side of the pyramid. And. Uh, this patient is not supposed to have fibrillation potentials, so we can go over to the next uh, uh, step. 
and that is voluntary activity. We are going to uh, ask for a very slight contraction. We trigger it on the sweep so that you uh, see the trigger level uh, up to the upper right uh, quadrant. Uh, and the trigger level is indicated uh, with a yellow symbol. I move the needle to get uh, uh, a good signal. And here is uh, just one motor unit that is active. In the lower right corner, we look at the stability of the motor unit shape. And you see that uh, on repetitive discharges, it is quite stable. Here we have a motor unit potential that is uh, triggered. And you see that it is, uh, has a slight complexity. And you can see that there is a slight variability in the uh, shape which is normal in this uh, uh, muscle in, uh, in the patient's age. So this is a way to look at the motor unit potentials individually. And I move the needle. And we can increase the gain in the lower right corner to, uh, to see the, the signal displayed a little better. And that is the stability window uh, which uh, shows the signal in a filtered form. We take away signals that uh, are below uh, 500 hertz and we can see the stability. So in general you see that the white lines there are quite okay and uh, one see spurious triggers as well. And then we start the recruitment analysis. We ask the patient for a very slight contraction and now a new motor unit is coming in. One can hear that in the background. And with increasing uh, rate, we see that uh, the other motor unit now is coming in. And this is now, we have collected a few different uh, motor units. And here is the result of the uh, recruitment pattern analysis. First, the uh, uh, brown motor unit that came in at the frequency of uh, 10 Hertz, that's called onset frequency, and with increasing frequency here, more in strength, then we recruited another motor unit, the blue one at the bottom here, and then a little later a yellow one. And here is the interpretation. Uh, the recruitment frequency is equal to the frequency of the brown when the next one came in. So in this case, 13.6. And the recruitment ratio is when we have a little higher uh, force and we have one, two, three motor units and the highest frequency is 14.8 divided by three is 4.9. And that is the recruitment ratio. The white line here is the continuous plot of the uh, recruitment ratio. We insert the needle and uh, ask the patient for a very slight contraction. And here we see individual motor unit potentials. And I stop for a, a new position of the electrode. And then we have new, new potentials here. And you see how they fill up the memory box. And here I accept that. I move the needle again to another position. Here are other motor unit potentials that we accept. And then I move the needle in a slightly different uh, direction in the muscle. Here we, we got a complex signal. And then we accept that. I move the needle again and we get one very high spike at, at occasionally that come very infrequently, but it was accepted. Then I move the needle again. That's a nerve spike. It can also the 
needle again. And uh, when we have now about uh, 30 motor units or so, uh, we are ready with that particular test and we are going over to interference pattern analysis. That means the pattern at strong contraction. So I, I ask for uh, a very slight contraction, we insert the needle and then we start to analyze for a short so, so pause. Then we analyze again pause, stop, pause, analyze, pause. Then I move the needle, analyze, pause, analyze, pause. And we do that all the time here. Analyze, pause, analyze, pause. And now we ha have obtained uh, maybe 20 different dots. And um, you see the, the distribution uh, to the right, it looks uh, slightly neurogenic, uh, which is just expected in, in, in this patient. Another way to do the interference pattern is by continuous uh, recording and analyzing and continuous slight movement of the electrode, like this. We start the analysis and I move, I move the needle all the time. And here is a strong contraction now. And relax. Now we got uh, again uh, many dots, and uh, they are uh, outside the distribution uh, with one technique and another technique where we uh, measure uh, another parameter. Uh, we, we got uh, different results, we have not discussed that. So this uh, looks with both interference pattern techniques to be a slight neurogenic pattern because some of the 20 recordings are outside the 95% the confidence limits. Uh, the study is finished and uh, we re remove the electrode and go to the office. And now we have finished the investigation and uh, uh, for the motor unit potentials we have collected uh, 30 of them and uh, we are free to remove uh, 10 of them and we still have 20 then. Here you see quite an erroneous setting of the cursor. That is one, uh, one indicator for removing and the other, th uh, the other type is that the signal doesn't really look at, at the motor unit potential at all. This signal, for example, is mainly recorded from the cannula, something we see in concentric EMG, but not really monopolar. Uh, here is, is a potential that had a very curious start, and the, this is a barely uh, multi unit potential at all. And now I look at the cursor setting. This has a wavy baseline, and therefore also an erroneous uh, cursor setting. Uh, and uh, we can uh, look at others with that have a, a, a wrong uh, uh, cursor setting without uh, discussing it more. Here is uh, one that we uh, removed and we have now 22 uh, potentials. If I want to, ch to change the duration, for example in this one, I can either, either uh, remove it or I can uh, pull the, the, the uh, cursor and you see when I press the cursor then the amplitude goes up to 100 microvolt per division. That is a, a classical way of doing visual uh, estimation. Uh, here also is one that we can uh, move over. I, I, I want to avoid the, the uh, manual setting as much as possible but sometimes it's necessary to do that. Well, this was demonstration and it takes a uh, little extra time for demo, but in real life it takes about half a minute. And here is the result for the MUP. We have duration on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis. And you see there are borderline amplitude and borderline durations also. And the mean value should be within the inner uh, quadrant here 
and it's just just uh, borderline uh, outside. So you have seen some aspects of quantitative EMG. In uh, my routine, I uh, use this in nearly 100% of the patients and usually in 70 to 100% of their studied muscles. The time for multi-map analysis and interference pattern takes three to five minutes and editing adds another 30 seconds. Thank you for watching. Thank you. So, Thanks. Uh, we, we will, uh, if you have a few more minutes uh, until time's out, so we can uh, maybe uh, um, uh, give you some more uh, questions here if you are ready. Uh, what are the ab abnormal spontaneous patterns uh, that we can see in a patient with neuropathy and myopathy? Uh, we can we can see uh, both fibrillation potentials and positive waves uh, in uh, both uh, neuropathy and myopathy and we should not call uh, fibrillation potentials we should not call them denervation potentials because we see them for example in in critical illness myopathy uh, and um, so the, the it's a misnomer they should be called uh, uh, fibrillation potentials rather than denervation potentials and uh, again warning fibrillation potentials are not necessarily denervation it can be a hyper excitable uh, muscle membrane is also polyphasia a good sign for re -innervation? absolutely it is a uh, typical and the combination of uh, polyphasia and uh, the stability or instability is a good way to, to characterize the, the re innovation potential. How can you grade severity of myopathy? Means mild, moderate, or severe? Um, yes, we, we uh, actually look at the, uh, uh, the um, interference pattern quantitative analysis that is the way we do it uh, and uh, the, the other way is the visual way is to uh, um, look at the envelope amplitude slow sweep speed full interference pattern and then you, you try to estimate the the top and the bottom amplitudes and get an uh, uh, so-called envelope amplitude it is uh, it is really not not very easy to to make a good grading of, of that visually. Okay, is it possible to see myopathic changes and neuropathic changes at the same time during an EMG study? I I should say uh, uh, no. To make it easy, the uh, High amplitude signals that we sometimes see in myopathy, polymyositis, and so on, they are often or usually of very short duration and they are not re innovation potential. They are high amplitude probably because they are generated by hypertrophic muscle fibers that are close to the electrode tip. Hypertrophy is typical in, in, in myopathy. So we may get the high amplitude signals and they should not be called um, uh, neurogenic. They, they should be called typical of myopathy. Uh, high amplitude, these high amplitude signals are seen together with a full interference pattern, typical of myopathy. Okay. I think this will be the last question. Uh, time is running out. So what is the physiological explanation for difference between fibs and positive sharp waves? Uh, we don't know exactly. And by moving the needle very, very carefully, we can transform a fib to a positive way and the other way around. We think that uh, positive way waves are uh, generated when the uh, signal is traveling towards the electrode and there 
all of a sudden it stops. It stops at the electrode. So it is some uh, funny situation. And the, um, the, the physiological meaning of them is the same. It is a uh, hyperexcitable muscle membrane. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think I'll hand it over to you and Abe to uh, summarize and finalize this meeting. Yeah, th thank you very much for uh, helping with the Q&A, Stefan. Um, and Eric, thanks again for um, offering this, this webinar for all of us. It was very educational. Um, we will try to copy the remain, remaining questions and send out an email with um, Eric's answers to any of these remaining questions that we weren't able to get to on the live webinar. Um, keep an eye open. We will be doing another webinar with, with Eric. He's been kind enough to offer to do a single fiber EMG webinar for us here in the uh, next, the coming weeks. So um, we will be advertising that shortly. And uh, Eric, do, do you have anything else you wanted to uh, end with? No, thank you very much for, for uh, ar arranging this uh, webinar. It is uh, um, really a, a good way, I, I think, to, to convey messages. Yeah, and it, it really helped because we had a very large audi audience. So um, it's nice to be able to do this when uh, everything seems to be shut down right now. So uh, please stay safe and healthy, everyone. And we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you.